could these combinations work together? And the person who's going to bring you to uh, this talk is a man from uh, New Zealand, all right? He's got extensive uh, leadership experience in public, private, and nonprofit sector. As a CEO, he has led organizations in UK, New Zealand, and was formerly the community director of the City of London. Presently, the CEO of an award-winning global learning design company called Inspire Group. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for James McCullough. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I do realize it's that time in the afternoon where the uh, minds are very full and the, the tummies are quite full as well. Um, so the good news for you is I'm not going to give you more information. I'm going to try and simplify things a little bit because here's the problem. Um, growth creates complexity. Complexity kills growth. Okay, so I want you to think about that. Um, so I've been very lucky in my leadership journey. I started out as a gardener. I became a landscape architect. I managed all the parks in the city of London. I've been around the world as a speaker and as a leader. I've been a CEO of a mental health charity. I've been a CEO of a recreation and urban forestry charity. I now work for a leadership development company uh, all over the world. Um, but, I'll, but I'm going, getting ahead of myself. So actually, let's start right back at the beginning. I come from a place called New Zealand. I'm not from a New Zealand originally. I was born in Australia, and I'm from the UK. Now, New Zealand is known for a number of things. Now, some of you lucky people have been to New Zealand. Some of you went to university there. Some of you, it will be on the bucket list to travel there. Uh, and it is a beautiful, outstanding place. It's known for kiwi fruit, OK? It's known for beautiful scenery. But it's also known for innovation. And the reason for that is New Zealand is a long way from the rest of the world. I can tell you that from my house in Wellington, New Zealand, I left there on it's about 19 hours to reach central KL with various flights and transfers and so on. It's a long way from the rest of the world. Now, what that means is when we need something in New Zealand, we have to invent it ourselves. The rest of the world isn't coming. Okay, So when we think about leadership or technology, we have to come up with new systems and we have to simplify things pretty quickly. Now, as I say, I've been all over the world, very, very lucky in the work that I've done. Uh, some of that's just by being in the right place, right time. Some of that is just by saying yes. And here's the, I'm going to try and give you lots of advice and guidance from my journey. One of those things is put your hand up and just say yes. And realize that actually you won't feel qualified or confident or certain about that. I can tell you that imposter syndrome is something very real. I think all of us feel that at some point or another. And embrace that, OK, in growing your business, in growing your organization, in growing your team, in growing yourself, OK? Imposter syndrome, gamify it. Make it fun. Think about what you got away with at the end of each day. Because what I've learned is actually the most important thing in the world. Food and shelter, it's pretty important, OK? But above all of that, look at all the global research, the most important thing is well-being, feeling good. You can be the wealthiest person in the world, but have an, a poor sense of inner well-being. You can be down on your luck living on the street, but be one of the happiest people in the world. Okay? So well-being is incredibly important. It's important to you. It's important to all of your staff, because when they don't have that, there's a huge cost to it, which I'll explain about in a moment. Now, we're conditioned to think that well-being and business growth and great leadership are three fantastic things to have, but you can't possibly have them all at once. Pick one. Well, here's a number, another number for you, 10,000 days. Now, what do you think that number might represent? I know it's late in the day and I'm asking you a question, but 10,000 days of your life, where might you spend that? I can tell you very close to guessing. It is, in fact, work. 40 to 42 years of your life, five days a week. Okay, we'll have some holiday. We'll probably have some time off sick. But that's where we're going to dedicate 10,000 days of our lives. Now, the question I'd ask you is why would you spend a single one of those days in anywhere that didn't make you happy? But the reality is that's what all of us do. And that's what a lot of your staff do. Okay, so that's a very important thing to understand. 10,000 days of our lives. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of book recommendations to save you the trouble of reading them, okay? Now, when I was 
going through my early leadership journey, I had a self-limiting belief I didn't have time to read. Oh, I've got time to read books. I'm too busy leading and growing businesses. But actually, if I'd read these books earlier, I would have saved myself a whole bunch of time and a whole lot of money. I'm a keen cyclist, so I read these books as audiobooks when I'm cycling. So I'm getting exercise at the same time. So just think about what thing you're doing in your life that means you could digest that information at the same time. The other important principle, and I'll talk about it today, is the one thing. Some of you are familiar with this, this whole concept of what is the one thing that I can do each day that makes everything else easier or unnecessary. It's very similar to the Agile principle. Number 10, what's the maximum amount of things that I do not need to do? It's a very important principle. Now, I've just finished this book, and I can't rate it highly enough. The Founder's Mentality. Okay, this is incredibly important, essential reading if you're scaling a business. Now, I've scaled businesses outside of New Zealand and around the world, and I wish that I'd read this earlier. Now, there's, I save you a whole bunch of time because there are just three things that you need to know. This is the founder's mentality. A huge sense of insurgency and urgency and focus on your mission in growing your business an absolute obsession with the front line, with the customer, never losing touch with that. And thirdly, and most importantly, an owner's man mindset. Now, when you're the owner, you have that mindset. You think about money all the time. You think about your time. Everything you're investing has a cost. But we're not all owners, and the people that work for you will not be owners. So instilling that owner's mindset in every member of your team is incredibly, incredibly important. Now, I'm lucky now because I work for a company called Inspire Group. We started in New Zealand. We went to Australia. We're opening KL in January, which we're very excited about. And we're expanding into this part of the world. And our simple ethos is that better learning is life-changing. We've developed leaders all over the world. We've done thousands and thousands of different leadership programs and culture change programs. And I'm going to share with you what we've learned from that. And I'm going to share with you rather controversially, I'm seeing if Roshan's still in the room, no, why a lot of leadership development is a complete waste of money. Because I'm guessing, actually, in growing your businesses, you don't have money that you want to throw away. I'm guessing, as well, you don't want to send your teams on things that are a waste of their time. You want a return on investment. Well, I'm going to tell you in a moment how you ensure that every single time. We've worked with hundreds of clients. Some of these names you'll recognize. And we're part of a $55 billion industry. I can tell you that today, somewhere in the world, a book, probably three or four books, will be published on leadership. Many of them will promise to give you the secret answer to growing your business and what leadership's about. They'll talk about new models. There'll be maybe a dozen TED Talks published today as well. And $55 billion spent every single year on leadership development. Well, I can tell you that the vast majority of that is a complete waste of money and time. Because otherwise, surely, the world would be full of great leaders. And we know that it's not. But this decision about who you make a leader in your business is incredibly important. One of the most important decisions you'll ever make. Now, Gallup do strength finder analysis, 25 million data sets they've analyzed from all around the world. And that's what they say. The most important decision is who you give that name leader to. You give it to the wrong person, you can give great compensation and benefits to the people around you. But ultimately, you know, if your leader's no good, that doesn't actually cut it. You will actually leave. People don't leave those organizations. They leave the people around them. Harvard. I should know a thing or two about this. The biggest impact on your health and happiness is the quality of your relationships. These relationships that are at work, remember, 10,000 days, the people we spend time with every single day at work, those relationships are very, very important. Here's a great one from the States. That leader is pretty important to your well-being and your health and your happiness. And for those of us that think, and I've had this belief as well, that we can just compartmentalize that. We can just say, it's only work, okay? I've got my evenings, I've got my weekends, I can actually, I can, I can deal with this. Think about the worst job you've ever had. Think about the worst boss you've ever had. And think about how you used to feel probably about 3, 4 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon when that feeling of doom came over you, when you realized it was back to work the next day. And think actually within your teams and within your own organizations about you would not want any single person to feel like that. 
So there's a bit of a problem, and the problem is this. The world of work is actually pretty horrible, okay? 35 to 50% of us will witness bullying or experience some form of bullying. There's unpleasantness at work, there's hidden agendas, there's all sorts of issues. Well-being, sickness, stress costs billions of dollars every single year in lost time, lost productivity. When you're in a job you don't love, when you're with a team that you don't love, you make poor choices. Poor choices of diet, relationships, habits, all of those things have a cost. It's not an employer's job to ensure your well-being, but it's certainly their job not to make it any worse. Now, if you want to dig a bit deeper and want a really depressing read on all of this, here is the book for you. This talks about the huge cost in terms of lives lost through poor workplace practices, primarily in the States, but looking at global research. Years ago, we were losing people in work because of construction accidents and poor safety practices. A lot of that's been tidied up in various parts of the world. Now we're losing people because of overwork and hours and stress and diseases that are attributed to their workplace and their managers and the work they're involved with. But you know, when you're doing that, and when you are dealing with difficult people, as we all do, and I can share with you here that I work with all sorts of different people at Inspire Group, at our offices in Australia, New Zealand, and soon to be here, and there are people that I like spending time with, and there are people that I find difficult. But even when they're being really difficult, and we all are difficult sometimes, remember this important quote up on the screen here, that everyone has someone waiting for them at home or at the weekend or someone that depends on them. And actually, very rarely are people coming to work deliberately trying to be difficult. There's all sorts of things going on in their lives. But you know, maybe the problem is simply that leadership is over complex. Now I can tell you, because I've Googled it, there's 32.7 million suggestions about what makes a good leader. So let's go through them one by one. Now let's actually just look at how we can save a little bit of time on that. I don't believe there's 32.7 million suggestions, but it shows why this whole area of leadership is over complex. You must believe it's complex if there's 32.7 million suggestions. And if we look at the different generations in the world of work, surely it must be more complex. Well, I've got a theory about that. Raise your hand if you've got a brother or a sister. Okay. Now, I've got a brother. He's about a year and a half older than me. We were brought up in the same way, same ingredients, same upbringing. We're completely different. We're the same generation but we are completely different. So think about your brothers, think about your sisters. If you've got kids, think about them, how different they are. Often they're the same generation, but they are completely different. There is a huge danger in research that generalizes. Millennials need this, this generation needs that. The answer actually is that every generation has slightly differing needs, but it's heart what people need is a social connection and work with real purpose. Now that's been the same for tens of years and it will be the same into the future, I'm convinced. So I've painted perhaps a little bit of a mixed picture. Work can be tough. Leadership development doesn't always fix it. Wellness and well-being and all of those things actually cost us money sometimes as well. And in all of that, how on earth do you ensure some business growth? So part two now, and a little bit of hope, hopefully. Because it's tempting, isn't it, to come up with new exciting models that must be better than what we had in the past. But you know what? This is the one, okay? If you can operate at the intersection of those circles, it's a pretty happy place to be. You're doing something with purpose. You're doing something the world needs. You're doing something that you love. It's brilliant. And of course, you're paid for it as well because we need to be paid for what we do. Now, I'm lucky I do that. I've had jobs where I don't do that, and I've left those jobs. But I was discussing with someone this morning how at different stages of your life, and remember this in your own journey, but remember this in your team's journey as well, you have different things going on. You're starting out in your career, you don't like a job, you just leave. 20 years later, you have a mortgage, you have kids, you have responsibilities, you have people depending on you, you can't just take those risks. So think about that in terms of your own team and think about the things that they have going on as well. And if you don't operate at the intersection of those circles at work and you can't change that immediately, 
change it in some other area of your life. Change it in the voluntary work you do, the community work you do, the connections that you have outside of work, and to give you that sense of purpose, because it is possible. Now at Inspire Group, we like circles as well. And what we try to do is look at data sets from thousands of different leaders all over the world, all the people that we developed, how they were doing years later, what difference it made in their lives, what were, the, what were the real simple essences of leadership for them. And here you go, there's not 32.7 million suggestions. So again, hopefully I can save you some time. There's just three, and it's simply this. You need to have a growth mindset if you're gonna be a great leader. Growth mindset, you can read about that, but I'll just break it down for you. A growth mindset is simply the ability to grow from your mistakes and to see your mistakes as a prescription for success next time. Now in scaling a business and growing a team, you will make mistakes and fail fast all the time. And that's brilliant, because if you're not doing that, you're not trying hard enough. As long as you see those as a prescription for success next time, and as long as you share those with your teams as well, and share that with vulnerability. You need to be able to lead yourself before you lead others. You need to be proud of how you do that. When I became a father 12 years ago, I had to change my whole approach to leadership and my team because I now had these other responsibilities that were important to me. Be proud of the balance in your life. Be proud of leaving to go to a school event or to go and see your grandchildren or whatever that thing is. Be proud to leave at lunchtime to go to the gym. That is leading by example, not being the last one to leave. There's a lovely um called Leaders Leaving Loudly, started with Pepsi and Walmart, it's spreading all over the world. And this is about leaders leaving early, leaving loudly and being proud of it because that is showing a great example for people coming up through their teams. And the final circle there I think is the most important. And if people ask me what, it's just, just tell me the most important thing about leadership. Now Roshan before said about be clear and clarity and I would absolutely agree because the most important thing a leader has to do is to direct and inspire. In fact, if you think about it, that's all a leader needs to do. They need to give clear direction and inspiration. But if they only do one of those things, it's no good. If you've had leaders that are very clear on direction, you know exactly what to do. You don't feel very excited or motivated at all that it's going to be life-changing or purposeful work. If you have a leader that's inspirational and energizes you, you feel incredible about doing your work, but you haven't got a clue what work it is you're supposed to do. So the answer is to direct and inspire. And the great leaders, what do they do? They alter that balance between direct and inspire thousands of times every single day. Probably dozens of times in every conversation. They read the terrain, they know their staff, they know the situation, and they're incredibly situational about their response. So direct and inspire. And the only way we direct and inspire, by the way, is through conversation. And if you want to know what leaders all around the world find most difficult to do, it is having difficult conversations, because it's hard. What do followers get most frustrated about from their leaders? They never have difficult conversations. They never tackle performance issues. They never do those things. They always have their favorites. They never challenge different behaviors. So conversations, and I think about the work that we do all over the world, and it sounds very simple, but the one thing that we teach leaders to do is to have conversations, quality conversations. Now, I'll talk a lot about simplicity if we had more time today, but simplicity is incredibly hard to achieve in any aspect of your life. But I doubt if I asked you all if there was areas that you were looking to make more complex in your lives, you couldn't think of one, okay? And in growing a business and scaling a team, you do not want more complexity. But here's the problem. Growth creates complexity. Complexity kills growth. So think about that. And as you scale and as you grow, what can you do to strip away complexity? What can you do to retain that feeling you had when you were starting out as a small enterprise, perhaps just with you involved? Nothing was simpler. But, save you another job, this book, break it down into nine steps, okay? About how some of the world's leading businesses, from Ikea to McDonald's to the Model T Ford and everything in between have simplified their businesses. But look at the bottom there, they've subtracted features, they've simplified, they've stripped away things, they've co-opted the customer to be part of their journey. And you can learn from that book how to do that. And apply that in any area of your lives. I won't touch on this too much because you'll get the slides, but basically the point here is that we're all changing as well. So the demands on our time are incredible. 
Research shows that the average employee has about 1% of their working week left to dedicate to their own development. Now you know if you work in a busy office how quickly that 1% gets snatched away. So I mentioned at the beginning that leadership development's a waste of money, which seems an odd statement for me to make. I make a living selling it. Um, $55 billion in the world is not full of good leaders. Leadership is a waste, development is a waste of money unless, unless you focus on these things. And the five things I'm going to share with you work whether you're developing your leaders, you're developing yourself, you're developing a product. They're the same rules to follow over and over again. And all that we did to come up with this is simply looked at all the research on why things fail and flipped it around. It's so simple that it works every time. And it's enabled us to scale over and over again. The first one is context matters hugely in what you sell and what you do and what you deliver. If you're on a program to learn more about something and the context isn't right, if the trainer is talking about a different language, they don't understand your culture, they don't understand your product, you've already switched off. Context is huge. Keeping it real, when you're looking at examples, when you're developing yourself, when you're developing your team, please don't use hypothetical examples, use real examples that you're struggling with with your business and with your team right then, because that does two things. Straight away, you're working on something in the room that will give you a return on investment. But here's the little secret trick. It also forces those people in that room to talk with real vulnerability and real honesty about the problems that they're facing. And I can tell you that that is one of the hardest things for a leader to do. It's hard when there's their colleagues in the room and they're being asked to talk about what's their biggest challenge, what's the thing that keeps them awake at night. So that is a great thing to use. Mindset is important, of course, I've already covered that. And measuring results. Whatever you do, whatever initiative you do, measure results. Now, years back we used to measure results for training by saying, was the room warm or cold, was the lunch nice or not? That's not results. That's just a, simply a reaction on the day. Results are one week, one month, one year later, did it actually change you? Did it change any lives? Do you show up home in better shape as a result of this leadership program? Are you spending more time with your children or less time with your children? What would people say about you when you're not in the room? That's actually your brand. All of those are incredibly important results. And the final area, but the one we forget, and it just links back so nicely, as if we'd rehearsed this to what Roshan said earlier, is about how we learn. I'd love to believe that everything I've said you'll remember. You won't. You'll remember a couple of slides. You'll remember that time from New Zealand. You'll remember about maybe the founder's mentality. If we spent more time together, if we worked through problems, that growth and that acceleration would grow. If we simulated those activities and worked on real challenges, it would grow even further. So again, never think that you can make a great leader or change a problem just in one intervention. It's a blend of things that happen over a period of time. Now, the other question we're asked as well is, OK, so the world of work is changing, notwithstanding what I said about different generations. What skills do people absolutely need? Now, we've taken for you here lots of great research from all over the world and distilled it down. And there it is. People need to be collaborative. People need to influence. But I bet if we asked that question 10, 20, 30 years ago, some of that stuff would still be there. So this is important core skills that will always be needed. Again, if we think about the future of learning and the future about product as well, it's already happened. Okay? Portable and personable and snackable. And snackable simply means that you can use that skill set when you need it. Now, I would argue that as you grow as leaders and as you grow your teams, when you need help to be a great leader is about three minutes before you have a leadership challenge, okay? Three minutes before you get into that difficult conversation, three minutes before you chair that team meeting that you're incredibly nervous about. You don't need it at a workshop six months before. You won't even remember it. You need stuff in your pocket that can help you with that there and then. And I think there's some great tools emerging in the market globally that will do that for leaders. But I mentioned about well-being as well. Now, there's so much written about well-being at the moment. Well-being might be having an office that looks like Google. Well-being might be free yoga sessions or free snacks. That's not well-being. That's just simply nice things to have. It's interesting, you know, if you Google Google and look at why people leave there, okay, and what it's really like to work.
look beyond the myths about the things that happen there. Okay, those lovely treats will keep people for a little while, but actually they don't go to the heart of it. If you want to ensure well-being with your team, you do those things. But if you want to break it down to just two things that give you well-being at work, having work with purpose and having social connection at work. Okay, so you're part of a team that you enjoy being with and you're doing something that means something. And my test for that would be the kitchen table test. When you get home at night, would you be proud to talk about something you've done at work that's made a difference in the world or in your team or in your environment? Would you tell your friends about it at the weekend if the answer is yes, you're doing work with purpose? Have you got people you can talk to at work and share these things with? Yes, you've got social connection. Both of those things are incredibly important. So try and promote that in your organizations and your growth will accelerate. Because the alternative is poor well-being and poor well-being costs billions of dollars. And there is a simple, easy to remember model, the PERMA model. So forget all those books about well-being, just apply those five different factors. Now I mentioned the one thing at the beginning, so as I begin to wrap up, I'm going to share with you our formula for developing leaders. And you can have this, we've got this on our website, and all of the stuff that I've shared with you as well is on Inspire Group and link in with me and I'll send you various bits as well. But this is our formula for how we develop leaders. And it's really, really simple. First of all, the what. What do we focus on? We focus on how the leaders be, not what they do. We focus on those three circles. How? Absolutely context. We focus on the thing that they need the challenge with in their organization right there and then. The why. Because everyone needs to feel a sense of well-being and psychological safety in their organization, in their team. And there's the result. The result is abundance. And abundance could be anything. So abundance could be profit. Abundance could be growth. Abundance could be well-being. Whatever it is that you're trying to achieve in your organization as you grow and as you scale. Now, I offered a gift. And the gift is simply this. We have a great range of products and services that we've done all around the world. And actually, we believe in sharing those. So we have two or three things there. We have a whole bunch of case studies about where we've done this and when we've won awards and where we transform teams and we have two free ebooks on all the tips and tricks that we've learned on growing teams and scaling teams. All you need to do link in with me or go on the website and you can download those for free. And just to finish up, you know, if I was going to talk about learning and leadership development and product, I would have to talk about this. We carry something in our pockets that gives us that immense power to do those things. So the future of leadership development and learning and growing and scaling is mobile. There's no doubt about that. But there's a reason you chose to come here today. I could have just sat back in New Zealand. I could have done a video call. You could have engaged with that. You could have listened to all the presenters doing that remotely, but you didn't. You chose to come here today. And you chose to come here for this, but you chose to come here for that, out there. You chose to come here for the connections and the engagement that you made and from the connections that will stay and will help you as you grow individually and as leaders as well. So never forget that. A lot of the magic just happens in the room and I believe always will. So I'll finish where I've begun. Well-being is absolutely the most important thing and if you don't believe that Think about that worst job experience, think about the team, think about the difficult challenges, think about the cost of that. But of course, in trying to achieve that, simplicity is incredibly hard. But when you get there, it really is the ultimate sophistication. Thank you.